Hello, Namaste, welcome everybody. This is Naveen Malakar. Um, I am really pleased to welcome Dr. Sam Cattell, our batchmate and uh, currently assistant professor of physics at Florida A&M University. Uh, he did his PhD in 2012 uh, from New Mexico State University and did postdoc at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, he uh, he's working on a very interesting topic uh, about computational modeling and design of materials um, uh, and uh, you know that I think the topic is for the sustainable form of energy fuel products I'm really excited to hear about his talk uh, he will uh, talk about uh, his uh, recent hot findings and we are so excited to have him uh, he has uh, 65 journal publications uh, 7000 plus of the Google Google Scholar citations uh, he is currently PI for two of the NSF funded projects, uh, 300k plus 650k um, in US dollar and co-PI of research, research infrastructure for science and engineering RISE NSF foundation uh, project uh, about worth a million dollar. So uh, Dr. Sam Cattell, the floor is yours. We are pleased to have you. Welcome. Uh, all right. Thank you, Navin. Uh, Thank you for invitation and thank you again for rescheduling my talk because I was not feeling really well. That's why I decided to reschedule and you cooperated very well. So thanks for both invitation as well as the re rescheduling of my talk. So um, uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to be back to physics community. Uh, mm -hmm. This was a lot of my friends here and I'm going to share some of my recent uh, work um, that I started back in uh, around 2016, 2017, and all the way um, until today's date. So uh, my research expertise is uh, computation. So I do computational modeling. So today I'm going to show some of the results that we obtained from computations. And the top, uh, the title of my talk is uh, "Computation Guided Material for Material Designs for Catalysis." Okay, so um, before I jump into catalysis, I just want to start with the energy uh, in general. So as we all know, the demand of energy is increasing and the chart on the left shows the increase in demand of energy from 1970 to 2025. And as we can see, there is more or less a linear increase in uh, energy demand. And if we look at all the energy, different forms of energy that we currently use, we are still heavily relied on uh, uh, fossil fuels, uh, oil, natural gas, coals, and so forth. And again, if we go and really look into these uh, fuels, then most of these fuels are in the form of chemicals. So that means we are really using these chemicals obtained from fossil fuels uh, to generate energy for uh, daily lives. So in that sense, renewable energy is definitely uh, are more appealing, but as you can see here, the percent, percentage of renewable energy is really small. So my research is more focused on uh, renewable chemicals and fuel generation using catalysis. And traditionally, if you look at all of these uh, processes where we generate these chemicals, then 80 to 90 percent of chemical products is actually produced by uh, at least they involve uh, some form of catalysis at some stage. And uh, if we look at the number, Catalysis in terms of uh, dollar amount, then uh, currently the market value is about $35 billion and then it's projected to increase about by four, about 5% uh, in coming years. So why this is important, I just want to give you one example. So ammonia is one of the chemical that is used to generate a fertilizer. And as we all know, fertilizer is needed if we really want to grow uh, crops. So the nutrients for crops is basically generated from ammonia and this ammonia is actually generated from catalysis. So this is one of the very, very important discovery of 20th century because uh, the ammonia that we generate from catalysis is actually responsible for growing uh, food for uh, more than half of the world population. So in that sense, the catalysis plays a really important role. And then we want to study catalysis, especially for renewable uh, type of energy or chemical synthesis. Now, since this is a physics community, so I just want to start with a very basic uh, concept, a uh, very simple question, what is catalysis, how it works? And I want uh, all of you to go back to high school chemistry 
and then see this very simple reaction. Uh, reactant A reacts with the reactant B and then we form products C and D. So um, just think about this re reactants A and B actually can react without any uh, assistance of catal catalyst, then we can make products C and D. So this is actually fine. And if you look at uh, what we call is activation energy, just think about activation energy as a hill that you need to cross. And for this thermal reaction without catalysis, the activation energy or the hill is really, really steep, very high hill. So you have to cross this black line and then cross that hill and then make the product. So it's very, very difficult process. On the other hand, if you do the same reaction, in the presence of a catalyst, then this is the red line here, then the hills are much, much smaller. So what does that mean? That means the reaction will uh, happen much, much faster in the presence of catalyst. So in that sense, catalyst is really important if we want to make the reaction faster. So this is a very simple picture. Again, this is uh, reactants A and B, they come into the surface of catalyst. So typically catalyst means, uh, just think about nanoparticle, and uh, on the nanoparticle surface, first these reactants A and B get absorbed. And then in between, they uh, react, form some sort of an intermediate where bond breaking and formation happens. And eventually we made product, we will make product C and D. And finally this product C and D will dissolve from the catalyst. So this is a very simple picture of how catalysis happens on the surface of nanoparticle. So, uh, even though this picture looks really, really simple, but there are several things going on. So the first one is adsorption. Of course, the molecules should adsorb on the surface of the catalyst. That's the first step. And then to react, uh, the, the to react these molecules or these molecules need to somehow uh, make and break the bonds. And sometimes they need to diffuse. So there is diffusion going on. And then after diffusion, when they meet each other, then they react uh, and then eventually form product. And finally, these products are dissolved from the catalyst. So this, all of these things can happen on the catalyst surface. So in that sense, it's a very, very complex uh, uh, process. Now, uh, in order to design catalyst, we need to understand this uh, process at atomic level. And once we have the fundamental understanding of these processes, then we can use those understanding to design uh, next generation of catalysts or next generation of materials. So in that sense, uh, what are the good characteristics or what are the characteristics that we look uh, in catalyst? So the first one is activity. So activity is again, how fast the reaction happens in the presence of catalyst. Second one is selectivity. Selectivity means, yes, the reaction may happen very fast, but if you are making a bunch of different products, then you have to separate those, those products and that's another hassle. So that's another difficult thing. Uh, we don't want to do. So that means what we are looking at is a catalyst that uh, does the reaction really fast and just makes one product. So that is very, very selective to that one particular product. And the third, a third characteristics, which is really important for industrial application is stability. So let's say if we have a catalyst that has very high activity, very high selectivity, but if the catalyst falls apart after like 10 hours of operation, then that has no meaning in industrial scale. So that means if we want to translate all of this knowledge into something that is uh, put, that could potentially change our life, uh, that means we need to think about industrial application and for that, the stability of catalyst, the long-term stability of, uh, stability of catalyst is really important. So in that regard, we are looking for catalysts or material that are active, very highly active, highly selective and stable. So again, how do we design the uh, catalyst? So for this, we need to really understand fundamental understanding of catalyst structure. So first of all, how this catalyst is composed. Sometimes you may have multiple components in one catalyst. So how these components are arranged, what is the structure, what is the morphology, uh, and what is the, uh, how these catalysts are attached to the support and all these details. So that's really important. Second, once the reaction happens, then there could be several channels to go from uh, reactant A to product B. So we need to know what are these possible channels and which channel is the energetically most favorable, all the details. And out of this uh, potential um, most favorable channel, we need to know what are the rate limiting steps so that we can control those steps and then optimize the catalyst operation. And finally, again, 
stability of catalyst, especially at operating condition, because typically you operate this catalyst at high temperature, sometimes even at high uh, pressure, and sometimes in solution. So we need to know what is the stability of this catalyst in the real operating condition. And once we know all of these things, then we can come up with the principle to design catalyst and optimize the catalyst. Okay, so this chart here shows kind of a traditional process uh, uh, how this catalysis is studied. So if you look at any industrial catalysis or catalyst, then these are typically powder catalysts. Uh, these are not single crystal, they are multiple uh, uh, different phases and they are uh, multi-component, they have support, they have metals and all these things and they are heterogeneous in that uh, regard. So that means this is really, really compli complicated system if we really want to uh, get a fundamental understanding, taking that complicated system is probably not a good idea. So what has been done typically is uh, look at some control experiment, uh, typically surface science experiments, and look at the model catalyst, and then look at some model reaction and get some fundamental understanding from there and then go from that fundamental understanding to design the powder catalyst. But recently, uh, due to the advance of computational modeling techniques, the approach is really now uh, started, uh, starts with the modeling. So that means we look at the catalyst structure, reaction mechanism, and all the details using some uh, computational modeling. And in particular, density functional theory calculation, which is electronic structural method. So this is very accurate. So in that sense, this is a kind of state of art a method to look at uh, the fundamental understanding of the catalyst, reaction mechanism, and so forth, and take that knowledge and then do surface science experiment where you can control some of the things and eventually you combine these two things about theory and experiment and then come up with a powder catalyst or multi-component catalyst that could potentially uh, be used as an industrial catalyst for industrial application. So in that regard, theory really plays a, a very vital role these days for the design of material in catalysis. So now, um, as I mentioned, my group uh, specializes in theory. So we are interested in the computational modeling and our workforce of uh, computational modeling is actually density functional theory calculation. So this is a physics community. I guess most of you know what is the density functional theory. It's just the method to solve uh, Schrodinger equation uh, and then get some um, details about the system. So uh, in physics language, that means we want to solve the system and get the ground state. So that means once we have the ground state, then we know the ground state energy on top of that, then we can do further other calculation to calculate uh, band gap, uh, phonon spectra and so forth. So in my case, uh, I can do the very similar calculations and then look at the active side of catalyst. So that means if you have a catalyst, then where does the reaction actually happens? What are the active sites in that a nanoparticle catalyst. So I can look at those using DFT. I can calculate what is the binding energy, how the interaction of uh, molecules with the surface or catalyst happens. I can look at that in detail uh, at atomic uh, picture. And on top of that, I can also calculate activation energy, reaction energy, reaction rates, and so forth. And once we have, uh, once I have all of these uh, uh, details from DFT calculation, then I can build a kinetic Monte Carlo or microkinetic modeling. And then from there, I can actually look at uh, microscopic quantities that I can compare directly with the experiment. So that means typically in our language, this is turnover frequency or the production rate of the products, uh, coverage, selectivity, and so forth, which I can directly correlate with uh, my experimental colleagues. And that will create a very nice feedback loop between experiment and theory to verify theory and also to lead uh, experiment to test new materials uh, in short period of time. And eventually our goal here is to actually find some simple descriptor so that I can use that descriptor to uh, quickly screen large set of material because you can't really do all of this calculation for hundreds of sets of materials. So, however, if you have a descriptor, then you can just look at that descriptor. It could be simple binding energy or anything like that. Then we can, you can just focus on that particular one step of a whole reaction network and look at uh, some other material and uh, guide experimentalists uh, for the design of material.
So uh, I'm going to show three examples uh, today. And I hope by the end of these three examples, I'll convince uh, the audience today that yes, computations are really uh, important and they can, um, in many cases, guide the experiments. The first one is carbon dioxide activation and conversion. As we all know, CO2 is a big problem these days. Uh, about 60, 70% of green, uh, greenhouse gas is actually CO2. And uh, we all know the amount of CO2 that we put into the atmosphere is uh, increasing because of a uh, uh, large increase in energy per, cap per capita around the world. So this, again, this, this increase in CO2 level in the atmosphere has been linked to climate change and so forth. So uh, people are paying a lot of attention how to solve this issue. This is a very difficult and complicated problem, both uh, scientifically and politically. Um, but here now um, I'm going to show at least uh, one of the ways how we can potentially control or recycle some of the CO2 that we already have in uh, atmosphere and then potentially make some uh, liquid fuels so that we can store those fuels and then use for uh, something useful. Okay, the first example that I want to uh, discuss today is carbon dioxide conversion to methanol. So methanol, as you can see, this is a fuel, so we can use that to uh, generate uh, power. So this is really important commodity chemicals in that sense. And um, this is actually nothing new. So this uh, CO2 conversion to methanol has been more or less done industrially using uh, a catalyst, which is called copper zinc oxide catalyst. So that process has been there about uh, maybe 15, 20 years. And... Uh, but this is not quite efficient in a sense that the selectivity of this catalyst is not that great. So people are interested to understand how this catalyst works and then see if we can uh, improve the selectivity by changing or tuning the composition of catalysts uh, uh, for this uh, CO2 conversion to methanol reaction. And this is especially important because this is already industrially applied catalyst. So if we, we can improve, then everything else is there. So we just change the catalyst and then improve the selectivity and that's gonna be great. So uh, to, uh, to start with, a couple of papers uh, came out and especially in 2012, there is a paper in science um, from both experimental and theoretical group combined work and they proposed that for this copper zinc oxide catalyst, the catalyst is actually copper zinc bimetallic system. Yes, you have copper and zinc oxide, but uh, eventually this catalyst will be transformed into copper zinc bimetallic system. And that copper zinc bimetallic uh, nanoparticle or bimetallic system, it's actually, actually doing the catalysis. And there was another paper, science paper again in 2016. Again, they correlated more or less the same finding. And here they clearly showed that there is a direct correlation between the methanol activity with surface zinc on copper zinc uh, nanoparticle. So that means if you increase the zinc amount, surface zinc, then that means you somehow maximize the copper zinc bimetallic system. And once you increase copper zinc bimetallic system, you increase the number of active sites, and then the number of active sites should be fairly uh, linearly correlated with the amount of methanol that you produce uh, from the uh, catalyst because the original assumption was that copper zinc bimetallic system is the active page, and if you have more active page, you produce more methanol. So that was the idea. And uh, in 2015, 2016, there are another series of paper that came out again on the exact same system. And in those papers, they claim that actually the catalyst will transform into a new uh, morphology, and that morphology consists of zinc oxide overlayer on copper. A nanoparticle. So that means the copper is basically covered by zinc oxide uh, overlay. So in that sense, there is no bimetallic system. And they propose this should be the active phase because there is no such copper bimetallic system. So whatever happens, this copper oxide, zinc oxide and copper should be the active phase. So we are motivated by this and then we decided to uh, look at both uh, uh, from theory part as well as experimental part and look at the system very carefully. So in that sense, uh, I did dense differential theory calculation and some kinetic Monte Carlo simulation on both systems, both copper zinc bimetallic systems. So uh, in this figure, in the middle figure, the down here is a copper zinc bimetallic system. So this blue is a cop zinc and the 
brown is uh, copper, so that means uh, there is copper zinc bimetallic phase there. And on the top, this is a zinc oxide, a small zinc oxide cluster on copper. So that means now I somehow created the interface between um, zinc oxide and copper as claimed on the last series of a uh, couple of uh, papers. And then we look at uh, um, TFT in detail. I'm not going to show all the details here. And uh, on top of DFT, uh, we built kinetic Monte Carlo simulations where we input all the DFT calculated energetics, including activation energies. And then we look at the methanol production rate. So as we can see here uh, on this copper zinc bimetallic system, at the beginning, there are some uh, activity. So that means we saw methanol production rate, but over time, the rate goes down and the catalyst is basically dead after 600 and 900 uh, seconds. On the other hand, on this uh, zinc oxide copper uh, phase, we see much higher production of uh, methanol. And this production of methanol is, is uh, steady over uh, our simulation time. Actually, we extended the simulation time and we did not see any decrease in uh, activity. And in particular, what we found was uh, during the simulation, our simulation so that this copper zinc bimetallic system actually will transform during the reaction in situ, it will transform into the uh, zinc oxide copper uh, type of interface. So this simulation, our uh, calculation clearly showed that yes, if you start with this uh, copper zinc oxide catalyst, eventually your catalyst will be zinc oxide on copper nanoparticle. And once you have that, then you see steady state formation of methanol over a long period of time. So that means the active phase of catalyst would be the interface between the zinc oxide and copper nanoparticle. And we also uh, did experiment and our experiment also exactly. So the same thing, once we have zinc oxide over layer on copper, then you see uh, methanol production activity. And it actually we, we found that about 20% coverage of zinc oxide on copper is maximum for the maximum uh, optimized performance of this catalyst. So this is an important uh, discovery or conclusion in a sense that there is a debate between uh, the active phase and now we are able to solve what is the active phase of this catalyst uh, using DFT, um, uh, kinetic Monte Carlo, and eventually with the experiment. And in fact, this whole calculus, this whole results were actually uh, motivated or derived by DFT calculations. So this is another example I want to show uh, uh, why these computations are really important. So this is uh, another system, again, CO2 conversion, but using not uh, hydrogen as uh, a co-feed, but rather using ethane as a co-feed. This is important in a sense that if you want to use hydrogen with CO2, then you need to get hydrogen from somewhere. And if you look at the technology currently available right now, then hydrogen is primarily produced from fossil fuel. So in that sense, you are not probably uh, mitigating CO2. You are not basically converting CO2 because your hydrogen source is coming from uh, fossil fuels and that is already generating CO2. So in that sense, maybe using some other source of hydrogen is uh, uh, useful or important. And we pick ethane, and this is especially important because in uh, US, at least these days, uh, the cell gas is really booming. And if you look at the composition of cell gas, 95% of cell gas is methane, and another uh, 3 to 4% is ethane. And this ethane is in uh, currently underutilized because all we use from cell gas is methane, and this ethane is just, uh, we are just uh, wasting. So in that sense, we can maybe take that ethane and then combine it with CO2 so that this ethane in that case kind of acts as a source of hydrogen and then do the same reaction. So again, we look at this reaction quite in detail. There are about 100 uh, elementary steps, as you can see in this middle figure. And we actually look at all these energetics. I spent uh, about a year to calculate all this uh, uh, binding energy of the reaction intermediates, uh, activation energy, and all the details. And then we built, again, a kinetic Monte Carlo simulation. And then we came up with only five or six different steps are quite important if you really want to look at this reaction. You don't have to look at 100 reactions. Just look at five, six different reactions. And then just focus on those six different reactions to design next generation of catalysts. 
So that was the result from uh, DFT and Kinetic Monte Carlo simulation. And we wanted we want, we wanted to test it, whether it works actually uh, in an experimental setting. So for that, we pick a nickel iron system and then perform just four or five, six steps uh, calculation using density functional theory. And this is uh, one of the examples. So in this case, this is a nickel three iron one on one system. And then we look at the uh, first step of this reaction. Uh, so you have, uh, you started with ethane and then you can make CS3, CS2, that's the first intermediate. And once you have one more hydrogen step from there, you get, uh, you produce ethylene, which is again, another important chemicals. And in that case, uh, we also look at oxygen insertion on this CS3, CS2 to make CS3, CS2O. And our calculation show that this dehydrogenation is not favorable. So that means this catalyst should actually eventually produce CO and hydrogen rather than ethylene. And we somehow change the composition of this catalyst a little bit. And now we have um, iron rich and nickel system. And again, we did a very similar calculation and our calculation so that in this particular case, uh, ethylene is ethylene should be the uh, product. So that means this catalyst should be selective to ethylene as compared to CO and hydrogen. And then we tested those things in experiment and then we found exact similar trend in selectivity for this iron and nickel rich uh, uh, catalyst. So that tells us that yes, competition can drive experiments and guide experiments to design new generation of uh, improved catalysts. So now this is the second example I'm going to show uh, to produce hydrogen. And hydrogen is, again, uh, we all know it's a clean fuel, but typically uh, hydrogen is generated from fossil fuels. So this is not really carbon friendly in that sense. So uh, an alternative process may be uh, using water uh, uh, so that we can split water and then generate hydrogen is uh, more, uh, attractive. So this process is actually uh, called electrochemical water splitting. So that means this uh, reaction happens at ambient condition, ambient temperature, ambient pressure. So in that sense, this is a really important reaction. And especially if we use uh, renewable electricity to uh, derive this reaction, then this whole process will be carbon neutral and we'll be able to produce hydrogen uh, indefinitely if we have a good catalyst. So here, uh, platinum is actually a good catalyst that's been there for a long time, uh, but we all know that platinum is very rare. So um, people are trying to find alternatives. If we can find other alternatives, cheap, uh, reliable, stable, but uh, having activity and selectivity as good as platinum, then that's uh, what uh, people are looking for. So in this case, we we were interested in a transient metal nitride system. So transient metal nitrides, uh, anybody who works in catalysis, these are really emerging class of uh, material. They have gained uh, increased interest in catalysis, both uh, thermal catalysis and electrocatalysis. So we wanted to look at these uh, uh, transient metal nitrides. And in this case, we look at 25 transient metal nitrides. And our goal is to modify these transient metal nitrides with platinum. So what we want to do is we have a, uh, just think about platinum uh, transient metal nitride nanoparticles. And then you want to put just one monolayer of uh, platinum on top of this uh, transient metal nitride. So in that sense, your catalyst has bulk chunk of transient metal nitrides, but just a little bit of platinum. And we want to test this idea, whether this platinum, this one monolayer of platinum is actually as good as uh, bulk platinum in uh, catalyst activity and selectivity. So uh, the first thing is we look at the structure. So that means uh, is this monolayer of platinum on transient metal nitride is stable. For that, we look at very simple thing, binding energy of platinum on those nitrides. And we found that the binding energy is significantly negative and a bigger value. So that means that yes, this system should be fairly stable. And then to look at HER, hydrogen evolution reaction, we look at uh, hydrogen binding energy, very simple descriptor on all of this uh, uh, system that we have. Uh, and then we also expanded our system of interest using a palladium monolayer on similar systems. So in that sense, we calculated hydrogen binding energy on platinum as well as palladium modified transmetal one-on-one surfaces. 
And then we clearly see that there is a large variation in binding energy, which somehow tells us that, yes, there is a possibility that we can potentially tune hydrogen binding energy and make that hydrogen binding energy as close or even better than platinum so that the overall catalyst, uh, catalysis would be better or at least comparable with uh, platinum. And that's actually what uh, our goal is. So in next slide, I want to show uh, the three energy diagrams. So these are kind of different diagrams for physics community. So what we are looking here is uh, looking at a reaction steps and for hydrogen evol evolution reaction, basically this there is just one single step, hydrogen adsorption on the surface of the catalyst. So uh, on the left, this is platinum modified uh, surfaces. And as you can see here, the steps in some catalysts is uh, really downhill. And in some cases, the steps are uphill. And again, just to compare, there is a platinum right here. So anything that is close to platinum should be should have catalysis or catalytic activity uh, comparable to platinum. And same thing here, this is palladium modified surfaces. And again, there is platinum. And we can see that, yes, there are a bunch of other uh, different candidates. They could potentially be as good as uh, platinum. To further confirm that, we calculated uh, limiting potential. So this limiting potential is just one simple descriptor which can be calculated using density functional theory calculation and that can be compared with platinum just to have an idea whether the system that we are looking are uh, any better or worse than the platinum. And again here you can see platinum is down here uh, and then uh, we see many candidates above platinum. So that means these candidates should have at least uh, as good as or better catalytic activity and selectivity uh, for HCR as compared to platinum. So this is uh, really important and we came up with a design principle. So if you now, if you want to look at similar system, then you don't really need to do all these calculations. Just uh, calculate hydrogen binding energy and then see if your hydrogen binding energy is in this range, negative 0.47 to negative 0 0.06 electron volt. If you find hydrogen binding energy in that range, then your system should have at least very similar catalytic activity compared to platinum, or in some cases, even better than platinum. So in that regard, we, we identify many candidates and some of these candidates are actually, have been experimentally uh, verified in uh, independently in different group. And so the figure here on the right is, uh, a plot between hydrogen binding energy and D band center. So D band center for physicity is just the center of D band. You calculate D band of platinum and then uh, calculate the center of this D band uh, using density of state plots. And then here we see kind of a linear correlation between D band center and hydrogen binding energy. Now, why is this important? As I mentioned earlier, you can actually look at hydrogen binding energy and predict which system is better than platinum or which is worse than platinum. Yes, you can do that, but sometimes that may be too much. So what we want to do is maybe just look at the catalyst. Don't do any uh, uh, intermediate uh, absorption calculation. Just look at the catalyst. You have a catalyst and then calculate the D-band center. So these are very quick and easy calculation. And then see if your D-band center is close to the D-band center of some of this uh, catalytic material. And if you see that trend, then you have pretty good guess, a pretty uh, good prediction that this system should be a good system to further explore both uh, computationally as well as experimentally. So this is just the guiding principle just to start uh, uh, designing the material without doing detailed calculations. So, um, so far, we have discussed about the activity and selectivity of those systems. So the final question is, are the system stable enough uh, to operate at uh, experimental conditions? So to test that, we actually look at uh, molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, and so in this case, we ran this simulation from 300 Kelvin, uh, which is the typical room temperature, all the way to 1000 Kelvin. And the results here are for 1000 Kelvin. And we can see that the structure of this catalyst is stable up to 1000 Kelvin uh, for duration of five picosecond uh, time frame. 
So that means this uh, catalysis structure, the architecture that we came up with, uh, improved catalysis should be stable. And uh, if you want to use those system as a catalyst, then it should work. And same thing here. So that means we just tested two different systems. And for both systems, we found that the structure remain intact for a five picosecond uh, at 1000 Kelvin uh, of initial and, and simulations. So here now I want to switch gear a little bit and then look at trans and metal oxynitride. So the motivation here is again, emerging class of material. So the question is how do we modify this material? Find this catalytic uh, group. One example was to pump. And I'll show you other examples as well. So again, here we want to put and so that means we transmit nitride, we replace one of the nitrogen with the oxygen and somehow create oxynitride system. And again, we want to look at uh, hydrogen evolution reaction on this uh, uh, catalytic system. Uh, here we explore about 15 trans metal oxynitrides. The story is very similar. We calculated uh, hydrogen binding energy. So in this case, this is particularly interesting uh, in a sense that this system, this uh, oxynitrides, themselves could be uh, used as a catalyst as well. So for that, we look at uh, nitrogen and oxygen vacancy, because if you think about this uh, oxygen nitride nanoparticle, then on the surface, you have nitrogen, you have oxygen, you have trans and metals. So there is always a very good chance that you form some sort of vacancies like oxygen vacancy or nitrogen vacancy. And I look at the train in formation energy of these vacancies. And in general, we found that nitrogen vacancies are more stable as compared to oxygen vacancies and especially this uh, uh, reaction is typically carried out at solution. So in solution, you might have nitrogen vacancy, more nitrogen vacancy as compared to oxygen vacancy. And same, same story, we look at hydrogen binding energy, calculated free energy diagram, and then uh, calculated limiting potential. And here we can see that hafnium oxynitride and zirconium oxynitride, they lie at the top of the volcano and their values are actually very comparable to platinum. So this clearly shows that again, these uh, systems could behave uh, or could show similar hydrogen evolution reaction activity as compared to platinum. So this is on a nitrogen vacancy. So we look at a nitrogen vacancy again, and again, similar story, same procedure. And we found that hafnium and manganese oxide, manganese oxynitrides, uh, these are potential candidates for hydrogen evolution reaction. So this is nothing new, so this is, uh, we calculate the current density. So this current density is especially important if you want to really compare with your result, your computational result with the experimental result. And again, we found a similar trend. Um, our calculated current density values are fairly comparable with the available experimental data. So that also gives us con confidence that our computations are right and the prediction made from the computation should lead to improved catalysis. So this is the last reaction that I want to discuss today, and this is a nitrogen conversion to ammonia. So uh, let me give you a background. So this is industrial process. This process has been uh, here for more about more than probably 100 years, and the process is called Haber Bros process. So in this, in that industrial process, what you do is you take nitrogen from air, and then you take hydrogen from some. Um, fossil fuel sources and combine in the presence of catalyst at high temperature, high pressure to generate ammonia. And this is, uh, as I said, uh, perfectly uh, fine and it's been there for a long time. So the question is why we want to re-study or revisit this reaction. Uh, the answer to that question is two things. First, this process is very, very expensive because it's been carried uh, out of and high pressure. So if you want a new plant, second, this process is also very carbon intensive. That means you generate tons and tons of CO2. So especially if you want to switch from fossil fuel to renewable fuel, then this is not the best that you'll be looking at. So what is the alternative? This means at room temperature, room pressure. So that means there is no high temperature, no high pressure. So this whole process is very, very energy friendly. And if especially whatever electricity you need uh, to run this process, if you use that electricity from renewable resources, then this whole process is uh, 
carbon neutral. So this is a really, really important and this is very, very appealing process as compared to the old process to generate ammonia. So uh, we, uh, we did some uh, work uh, in 2019, I guess, 2018, 2019, and then we found that again, this transient metal nitrides and oxygen modified transient metal nitrides are especially very interesting candidates. So uh, we did uh, the first study came out in uh, 2018 and it was on vanadium oxynitride. So both competition and experiment suggested that this vanadium oxynitride is a good catalyst for converting nitrogen to ammonia at amb ambient condition. And this, this process is called uh, electrochemical nitrogen reduction reaction. So then we wanted to uh, expand that study and include other transmetal nitride and then see if we can find some other candidates that are fairly comparable uh, catalytic activity as compared to vanadium oxynitride. So we look at a bunch of different candidates uh, and then uh, we look at uh, all the reaction energetics in detail. So this is a complicated uh, uh, diagram here. So what I'm trying to show here is how we can convert nitrogen to ammonia. What are the possible channels? What are the possible pathway? What are the possible intermediates? So in general, there are three different routes. The first one is uh, you have nitrogen and you somehow split this nitrogen, nitrogen bone and you do hydrogenation reaction to make ammonia. That's uh, one uh, pathway and which is called dissociative pathway. It is called dissociative because you immediately break this nitrogen, nitrogen bone and then do further reaction. And the other two pathways are called associative pathway. And I, I have uh, summarized here in those two pathways, first nitrogen is converted to some sort of hydrogenated product. So in first case, this is N2H. And in second case, this is N2H2. Uh, and then you somehow break this nitrogen, nitrogen bone and do the further reaction to generate ammonia. So uh, to look at, or to find out which uh, reaction route is uh, more favorable or which reaction route is actually plausible, we need to do this calculation and look at the free energy change between the different various steps that are involved in each of the reaction channels. So this is, uh, again, a complicated reaction uh, diagram. I don't want to go in detail. So the, the take-home message here is uh, vanadium oxynitride, titanium and manganese oxynitride they have fairly mild change in free energy. So that means they could potentially promote the nitrogen reduction to ammonia. And we did similar reaction, uh, similar calculation for remaining two associated pathways. And we found that again, scandium nit uh, nitride and yttrium nit oxynitride, they are, are kind of uh, in a different zone. They do not promote the reaction uh, quite efficiently. All other candidates should potentially promote the reaction using the associate, uh, dissociative pathway. And then again, the next question is, how do we uh, know or how do we come down to a few candidates that are potentially uh, worthwhile exploring both computationally more in detail study as well as experimentally. And for that, to answer that question, we calculate a limiting potential. So this limiting potential means it's lower the limiting potential, uh, you need to input a lower amount of energy to do the reaction. So that's, that's the idea. And here we calculated a limiting potential and we can see that titanium, vanadium, and manganese, they have quite low limiting potential. So that means these candidates should fairly efficiently promote uh, the nitrogen reduction to ammonia. So that means from this, uh, out of these 10 or 11 different candidates, we came up with these three candidates that should, uh, they, they should promote the reaction fairly efficiently. And then uh, again, going back to uh, the descriptor thing, yes, we can do this calculation. Uh, you can do hundreds of DFT calculation, make this plus, calculate limiting potential, and then you can come up with a few candidates, which is perfectly fine. However, if you want to really look at, uh, let's say, 100 candidates in short period of time, then you can do all of this uh, forever. So to do that, we have to come up with a very simple that one of the discrete for energy calculation. So uh, and to that question, we we'll look at uh, and uh, look at the relation between and energy and 
empirically shows that there is some sort of like volcano relationship between nitrogen binding energy and limiting potential. So what it is telling us is you don't have to look at all these reaction channel. You don't have to look at all the intermediates and do hundreds of DFT calculations. Now what you need to do is just focus on nitrogen binding energy and then just see if your calculated nitrogen binding energy is comparable to the nitrogen binding energy we reported in this paper. And if those values are close, then you can fairly easily predict that these candidates should be good candidates for nitrogen reduction to ammonia. And on top of that, we also look at the nitrogen binding energy and NH binding energy, and it's, it's another uh, intermediate. And then we see a linear correlation. This linear scaling relation also tells us that, yes, you can also look at NH binding energy. So that means you have now freedom. Either you can look at nitrogen binding energy or you can also look at NH binding energy to come up with uh, uh, or to predict uh, better candidates for uh, nitrogen reduction to ammonia. However, this uh, nitrogen reduction to ammonia is a little bit tricky in a sense that uh, there is a competing reaction. It, this reaction happens in solution. In solution means you have water, and if you have water, then hydrogen evolution reaction competes with this uh, nitrogen evolution reaction. So any, any selective catalyst should uh, selectively promote N2 reduction to ammonia, not hydrogen uh, evolution reaction to produce hydrogen because you don't want to produce hydrogen and, and ammonia together. So for that reason, we look at HCR again, hydrogen binding energy, free energies, and then we look at uh, limiting potential with hydrogen binding energy. And we can see that many of these candidates, uh, for example, manganese, chromium, which were good for N2R, are, are also good for HCR. So that means this manganese and chromium may not be the selective candidate uh, for N to R R and our calculations show that actually nickel. Uh, I think I don't have the result here. Yeah, uh, titanium and vanadium oxynitrides. So when we compare in detail, then we found that titanium and vanadium oxynitrides are actually two candidates that should sort of selectively promote nitrogen reduction to ammonia. And finally, this is uh, uh, just a slide for. A nitrogen reduction on transient metal oxynitride 100 surface. So the result I showed before, they were on 111 surface, and here now we are switching to 100 surface. So the difference is uh, 111 surface is uh, thermodynamically most favorable one of the surfaces. And this 100 surface is another thermodynamically more favor most favorable surface. So in reality, when you do experiment, you have nanoparticle and you might have a nanoparticle that has both surfaces, one on one surface as well as one zero zero surface. And in some cases, if you find one surface is better than the other, then you can potentially come up with a synthesis technique just to synthesize particle with just one surface. Maybe if, let's say if one zero zero surface is the best, then maybe you want to optimize your synthesis process to have nanoparticle with just one zero zero surface so that you have a lot of catalysis happening on the surface. So to, to have that answer, we look at in detail again the ENRR, nitrogen reduction on one zero zero surface, and we found kind of similar result as compared to one on one surface. For one on one surface, vanadium, chromium, manganese were some of the best uh, candidates. And here again, we see similar thing, manganese, chromium, and vanadium. Uh, are also good candidates. On top of that, we also found that um, iron oxynitride and copper oxynitride, they also fairly uh, easily promote nitrogen reduction to ammonia. So the figure on the right is a complicated figure, but I just want to summarize uh, very briefly. What we are doing here is again, trying to compare our result with the experimental result. So this is actually a 3D plot on axis on x-axis, you have nitrogen binding energy. On y-axis, you have N2S binding energy. And in z-axis, you have uh, uh, current density, log, log of current density. And here we see that uh, this red region is the region where we, you want to be because that's the reason where there is maximum current. And we can clearly see that zirconium, hafnium, uh, titanium are very close to this uh, red region. And again, this, uh, this curve or this plot shows that if you want to have a catalyst with the maximum current density, 
then they, that catalyst should have nitrogen binding energy about nine electron volt and N2H binding energy about 4.5 electron volt. So that means if you explore a bunch of material and you found that nitrogen binding energy is nine electron volt and N2H binding energy is about 4.5 electron volt on one of the material, then, then that material should actually show the high current density and be the best catalyst. So again, this is more or less the design principle or guiding principle, how to screen um, large number of candidates and select few candidates for experimental testing. So now uh, I want to stop here and just to, uh, want to summarize uh, the, the talk uh, that I just finished today. So the summary here is uh, theoretical calculation can provide atomistic picture of catalyst, reaction mechanism, and so forth. These are typically very difficult to obtain from experiments because as you can see, imagine you can't really visualize individual atoms in uh, experiment, but in theory, that's what we do. So that means we can look at individual atoms, um, individual molecules, and the interaction between the molecules and catalysts and so forth in detail. So that means, uh, especially these DFT calculations are accurate, so that means we can get accurate picture of this bone forming and bone breaking process at atomic scale. Uh, so when DFT calculations are combined with microkinetic modeling or kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, then that will somehow minimize the gap between the experiment and theory. Uh, the gap here means theory, DFT calculations are typically carried out at atomic scale. So that means your catalyst is maybe one nanometer, two nanometer, and there is no temperature, there is no pressure. On the other hand, in experiment, these catalyst particles are typically big, like at least 10, 15, 20 nanometer. nanometer. So there is a material gap between uh, modeling and experiment. On top of that, experiments are typically carried out at some temperature, like 300 Kelvin, 500 Kelvin, uh, as well as some pressure. So that means that gap uh, is also there between experiment and theory. However, if we build microkinetic modeling or kinetic Monte Carlo simulation using the DFT energetics, then we can input a temperature, uh, we can input a pressure, so that will help us to minimize the gap between the theoretical prediction and uh, experimental realization. Uh, really important from DFT calculation, when combined with uh, kinetic Monte Carlo and uh, microkinetic modeling, we can come up with some simple descriptors and that would be really important to guide experiment or experimentalists to design improved catalysts. Uh, the examples here uh, I showed uh, emphasize one more thing a close collaboration between experiment and competition or experimental group and competition group because there should be a synergy and a feedback loop between experiment and theory if you really want to design a uh, next generation of uh, catalysts in short period of time. For theory, uh, I just want to mention one key challenge. So competitions uh, are typically performed at uh, vacuum. Uh, zero Kelvin, especially DFT calculation. So you should always come up with some idea to somehow um, minimize the gap between experiment theory. That means your computation somehow mimic the experimental reaction condition. And that's uh, actually one of the biggest challenges of computational modeling. So with that, uh, I want to thank my former PhD student who did uh, most of the work for nitrogen reduction and hydrogen evolution reaction. Uh, so he graduated and she's uh, currently at Intel. Uh, I want to thank uh, NSF grants. So I have a couple of NSF grants. Uh, and they, they have been really supportive for uh, computational time because I use supercomputers. So I typically use uh, several national uh, supercomputing facility and I have been using Exceed. I think they changed the name. Now I, I guess the name is Access. This is an NSF funded supercomputer and I also use uh, supercomputing facility as a Brookhaven National Lab. And i just an uh, add here. So I have a couple of NSF grants. So I'm looking for uh, at least two PhD students as soon as possible for students. I think as soon as possible means the start of the semester. So uh, if anybody is interested in joining my group, please apply uh, so that this position are available as soon as uh, spring. And at the meantime, uh, also looking for a postdoc position uh, to start as soon as possible. So I'm looking for a postdoc who knows how to do DFT calculation. And it would be better if I can find somebody who knows how to build a kinetic Monte Carlo 
or microkinetic modeling for catalysis. So with that, uh, I'd like to stop here and thank you for your attention. Uh, and I'll be ready if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is great. Uh, very interesting talk. I, we have a couple of questions uh, on the chat here. Uh, should I read it to you? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, <clears throat> Bipin Lamichane is asking, uh, thank you for the nice talk. What functional is used in zinc oxide copper triple one system and how surface properties would change from the higher functional? And there are follow-up questions to that. Uh, okay, so for this copper zinc oxide system, I use, uh, let me remember, PW91, I believe. Uh, that's most of the time I use that, but occasionally I use PBE. We did not, and, and on top of that, we use Hubbard U parameter just to make sure that the electronic stocks are right. Um, the higher level of uh, functional, especially the hybrid functional, is very, very challenging to do this calculation with the hybrid functional, especially if you want to do activation energy calculation. The reason is if you want to do activation energy calculation, then you typically run like four or five different calculations together. And in my case, one calculation typically needs something like uh, maybe 64 to 128 cores. And uh, if you want to do Hive calculation with hybrid system on my system, that's probably impossible. All right, there is a follow up on that one. My another question is how many atoms are there in the system since NEB is computationally expensive calculation? Uh, so typically, my system's uh, size uh, ranges from like uh, 32 atoms to sometimes uh, about 200 atoms. So, and I was actually able to do NEV calculation for 200 atoms, but it also depends how many NEV calculations you are planning to do, right? So, uh, I think I did not show all the details, but in some of the cases, I have done over 100 NEV calculations. So, if that's your plan, and if you have 200 uh, atom system, then maybe you need to look at alternative. But if your system is 32 atoms, and then you have enough computational power, uh, you could potentially do 100 NEV calculations. Cool. So the, the answer is it really depends on the system and what you are looking for. I see. The final question is, do you use Hubbard uh, correction to transition metal like magnesium? Uh, just, just for magnesium, we for just magnesium itself, I haven't done any calculation, to be honest. But uh, if you are looking some oxide, uh, Typically, oxide, they need uh, some sort of correction, uh, U-correction. And then, yes, I, I use U-corrections. Very cool. Uh, we have Takat Rawal, um, and he has a question uh, with the follow-ups. So at the beginning, you mentioned that the DFT is accurate model uh, method. However, the accuracy depends on the approximation you consider. If you consider only the GGA approximation, then it may not be enough for the zinc copper system that we you just talked about. Can you comment which method have you used for describing the exchange and correlation of electrons? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's a good question. So I said accurate method in a sense that uh, out of all available method that we can potentially use to model uh, catalysis that take account uh, some sort of like electronic structure uh, in, in them, right? So in that sense, yes, DFT is more or less the uh, state of art, but within DFT, there are different methods, different functional, different approximation, and then which one you need to pick, that depends on your system, what you are trying to look. So in my case, I'm looking at catalysis. So for catalysis, actually, uh, the functional I use is not actually the best. There is a functional RPB. That's what people claim that's the best in catalysis. But what I'm looking is really trend. I'm not trying to compare the absolute value in many cases. I typically look a bunch of material and look at the trend. And if you are looking at the trend, and if you get the electronic structure right, then uh, your functional choice of functional is less important. So that means first, yes, of course, you need to correct the band gap if you are looking at uh, some oxide system. No matter whether you are using PBE or PW91 or any other function, then you have to somehow correct that with the U values. And once you make sure that your electronic structure is right, then uh, at least uh, the choice of functional itself is not really uh, that big of a deal. 
All right. Cool. How do you determine the D-band center? It has been used for metal systems. Is it good for metal oxide system? That's from, again, from the Taka Travel. Uh, yeah, D-band center is really popular for metals. And again, as you can think, uh, it's a D-band, so you are looking at the D-band of metals, right? So now if you want to look at a metal oxide, um, then yes, you can look at D-band, but in that case, you are not considering the oxygen. You are just looking at the D-bands of metals because oxygen doesn't have D-band, right? So yes, you can look at, but how effective it will be, uh, uh, you, you have to test. Yeah, okay, the follow-up. And, and, yep. and just, just a comment, uh, actually there are other methods uh, these days people propose and for potentially this uh, oxide, let's say magnesium oxide or any oxide system, you can potentially look at D-band as well as P-band. People also propose P-band center and oxygen has P-band. So you can potentially look at the P-band and combine with the D-band uh, to come up with a new uh, descriptor. Okay, I apologize. It's a magne manganese. Uh, I've said magnesium, so. Oh, okay. My mistake there. Anyway, um, so the question is that you mentioned that N vacancy is more stable than O vacancy. Did you calculate the diffusion barrier for these vacancies? No, we haven't uh, done that. So what we did was this reaction is typically in solution. So let's imagine you have this uh, nitride system lying on solution, then you have water, then what could potentially happen is this, uh, you, you can potentially generate a hydrogen from water and that hydrogen would attack on the oxygen that is on the surface. And then that will make water. And that's how you create this oxygen vacancy. And for nitrogen, similar story. Hydrogen will attack nitrogen and you make ammonia. And that's how these uh, vacancies are created. In fact, one of our experimental papers showed that, yes, you can have this oxygen and nitrogen vacancy, but we haven't looked at how they will um, diffuse. Right, because I think the nitrogen, uh, the reaction for HN3 is uh, high pressure, high temperature, right? The, you know. The whole process was an innovation. Isn't that the case? No, the, the process that I'm interested in is actually low, low temperature. It's ambient condition, condition process. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, there is another question by uh, Ganesh Tiwari. Um, thank you, Dr. Katel, for this nice talk. Um, we all agree on that. My question is how catalysts decrease the potential energy of the reactants? From the slide one, you know, uh, basic question, which is really important. Okay, so, oh, can I go back to slide? So the question is, how does it really work? Right, sometimes we take that as granted. This one? The first one, yeah, I think it, yep, the first slide. Um, the first so time when you introduce the question the is... Um, how catalyst decrease the potential energy of the reactants? Oh, okay. So typically what happens is uh, catalyst somehow uh, optimize this process uh, by, uh, by providing the right strength of interaction between the uh, adsorbent and the catalyst surface. So a catalyst means that should have the right interaction between uh, the uh, reactant and the surface. It should not bind too strongly it should not bind too weakly. If it binds too strongly, then the catalyst will be poisoned because you kind of bind and you can't remove those things. On the other hand, if it binds too weakly, then there will be more desorption as compared to binding. And if everything dissolves without binding, then there is no reaction. Okay. So it's, it's basically the interaction, uh, the, the optimized interaction between the catalyst and the uh, reactant. And that's what we are looking for, basically, when you screen the material, and that's what we are looking for. So the catalyst does need to interact in some way with the, the product. Absolutely. Uh, the, the yes. Yes. Reactants. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So Takat Rawal, thanks you very much. Appre you know, much appreciated for your answers. Great talk. Thank you so much. From Can you ask a question? Please. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, Tara, sir. Namaskar. Eh? Yes. Yeah, namaskar. Um, anyway, very nice talk, uh, Katilzi. Uh, I really enjoyed. Um, so my question is, why is that? Platinum is such a good catalyst for water splitting. Okay, so to answer that question, again, I have to go back and look at the interaction between the 
the, the reactant and uh, the catalyst. So for hydrogen evolution reaction, the intermediate that we care too much is uh, hydrogen itself. And if you look at this uh, binding energy of hydrogen, then that binding energy is right in that range. And that we can see from the free energy plot. So free energy plot basically means uh, you uh, look at the free energy of the uh, reactant and catalyst system, and then look at the intermediate and the product. And if there is high barrier, high free energy change, that means the, the reaction is difficult. But for, cat, for platinum, it happens that that free energy barrier is very close to zero. So that means there is basically a very small barrier for the reaction. So for that reason, you don't need to really input uh, too much energy. Once the catalyst is there, platinum especially, reaction happens uh, spontaneously. That's one thing. The second thing is the stability of catalyst. And platinum is a noble metal uh, and it's very stable in solution. So that's another reason. Sometimes you might find the catalyst that has the right binding strength, but when you put the catalyst into the system, it falls apart and then everything is done. Okay, so I, I just have a follow-up question on that. Um, you, you showed uh, several plots of a limiting potential and uh, binding energy. So for example, in case of let's say platinum, if, if the purpose is to produce hydrogen, then I would assume that it's some binding energy of hydrogen to platinum, the limiting potential should be pretty minimum, right? Yes. So my question is, what is that? What's the difference between when you see that there is a very low limiting potential? If I just understand in terms of potential being a usual potential energy, so that there's such a, you know, like low potential to bind that hydrogen, but at the same time you have energy on the axis scale which is which could be pretty large uh, like binding energy what's the difference there okay so the limiting potential is the potential that again this limiting potential is somehow related to the free energy plot so if you look at the free energy plot uh, let me show you let me show you a complicated one not the simple one so again, let's look at this free energy plot. And here you can see many, many steps, right? Some of the steps, steps are uphill, some are downhill and so forth. So in this case, if I want to define a limiting potential, then limiting potential is the minimum applied potential that I need to apply to make all the steps downhill in energy. So that means lower the lim limiting potential, the better the catalyst is because in that case, I just need to apply a small amount of energy and everything will be downhill and they will flow easily. And same thing for uh, platinum. So my plot here, in this case, is a plot between the limiting potential is, again, as I said, calculated based on the free energy plot. And this plot is a plot between limiting potential and hydrogen binding energy. So right now, they may not have anything to do each other, but this hydrogen binding energy can be used to make free energy plots. So in that sense, they are correlated. So what we are trying to do here is we are trying to come up with the binding energy range that will produce the minimum limiting potential. And especially I want to look at the top of this volcano here. And for the top of this volcano, the energy range here is actually minus 0.47 to 0 0.06 electron volt. So in that range, if I find hydrogen binding energy in that range, then that should be somewhere close to the top of this volcano. And that's what we are looking. So again, going back, limiting potential is the minimum potential that you have to apply to make the reaction going. And this is a correlation between the limiting potential and hydrogen binding energy, just to come up with hydrogen binding energy as a descriptor, rather than calculating this uh, free energy diagram, limiting potential and so forth. Again, you have to use hydrogen binding energy to calculate free energy diagram, but to do that, you need to do additional calculation there. I haven't shown that here. So I don't want to do all this. I just want to look at the hydrogen binding energy. That's it, and that's the purpose of this plot here. Okay, I have one last question if there's time. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay, so you, you showed a, a copper, zinc oxide copper system to 
to form, I think it was ammonia. Um, this one? Yes. Yeah, the one previously before that. There was, a, there was, you had experimental data on the rate. Uh, if you go one, one slide back. This yeah. one? Yeah, so I'm just trying to understand this. Uh, the production is actually methanol, right? This is methanol, right? Yes, yes. yes. So you have around point, uh, I guess, 0.09 uh, methanol per second. Is that, is that really a game changer? You were mentioning that, I mean, the process is there for a long time, but it's not very efficient. What is that number? Is it really, really good number? No, the number is not really good. In fact, this catalyst is actually more selective to carbon monoxide as compared to methanol. So right. in that sense, this is not a game changer. Our finding was really important just to distinguish between the active phase of the system. And that was our goal. Our goal is not, our goal here was not to increase the activity and make a high production of methanol. Our goal here is to get the fundamental understanding of what is the active site, where the catalysis happens, so that in future you can take that knowledge and maybe optimize the catalyst to make this methanol production uh, bigger. Thank you. I really enjoyed it, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. That is awesome. Um, very nice. Uh, one uh, like a very basic question and then we can go for, uh, if you have time, you know, for, if, for people in the audience, we can go for informal session for a few minutes after that. So I see, you know, the lines and then um, I see the lines dot, you know, joined by the, the like, you know, uh, is there an assumption going on that it is going to be a continuous process? Like if you go from one structure to another, there is like a, you know, continuous process because the you know whenever you change certain configuration the energy difference for example could be um, you know discrete right it's not a continuous process mm -hmm. whenever you show the correlation graph whenever you show the energy diagram you know i see continuous line and th that kind of scares me that's my personal you know yeah yeah i i see what you are talking about yeah so this is just uh what we call fitting uh -huh. uh, between the points but yes you are right uh, in between the two points I have in my plot, there could be millions of points and they may not fall into that uh, straight line or whatever fitting you are doing. But I guess uh, that's how people do and then th that's how... Uh, that that can be yeah. scary because, you know, you're trying to think between the between the points and, uh, you know... Yes, I understand. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Cool. I agree. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It's really great uh, to hear you. So I will stop the recording and we can go for informal session for a few minutes. And just before we go, uh, we have a, a session coming up um, with, uh, let me just share my screen quickly, okay? Just, uh, if I may. So um, we have a session coming up uh, with the innovation, innovation in teaching session with Dr. Ramesh Tungana as the guest speaker. Um, and uh, he is the assistant professor at University of Colorado Denver. He will demonstrate some of the examples that he used in the class for engaging students. So um, please, uh, you are in, invited, please come. And then uh, next month in collaboration with the Eldridge Astronomical Society uh, in Massachusetts, Worcester State University and Nepal Physical Society, we are inviting a person who makes literally that image in the JWST uh, website that you see. Uh, Joe DePacala, uh, DePascal, sorry, uh, and uh, uh, we have it coming along, so we are excited about it, uh, hope to see you. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop here and then we can talk for a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, it's really good to have.